Good afternoon and a very warm welcome uh, to all of you who have uh, uh, registered and uh, who are currently on, on board for a very, very interesting uh, uh, program that we have lined up for you. Uh, today, we are going to be talking of the challenges and opportunities for technology industry of Sri Lanka post um, We have got a very eminent uh, uh, list of panelists as well as we've got a very eminent keynote speaker with us today uh, to ensure that uh, actually can take back some very valuable inputs as to how we should be addressing some of the key challenges and opportunities that we're going to see um, uh, post COVID as well, as well as during this period of uh, lockdown. So I would first start off with introducing uh, our keynote, uh, our keynote speaker as well as our elite list of panelists. Uh, we have with us today Mr. Jayanta Silva of the ICT Agency of Sri Lanka. We also have with us uh, Mr. Arjuna Herat, Partner, Head Advisory Services of Sri Lanka and Maldives, Ernest and Young. We have Professor Lalit Gamage, President and CEO of Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, SLWI. We have Madhu Ratnayaka, uh, Chief Information Officer of Vartuza. Uh, we have Dr. Nayana Dehigama, Managing Director of Epic Technology Group. We have Riza Vadud, Country Manager for IBM in Sri Lanka. Uh, we have Jeffrey Zulfa, founder and CEO of PickMe. And uh, last but definitely not least, we have uh, Ginsara Dias, the country manager, Sri Lanka for HP. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, our sponsors as well. Uh, we have uh, our event partner, uh, we have uh, Softlogic Technologies. And also, so I'd like to uh, very heartful thank th th thanks to Softlogic. And uh, we also have uh, our other partners who are with us uh, for this forum, uh, our knowledge partners, our corporate partners, Lanka Bell, LK Domain Registry, Luna Labs, Aurel IT, Sarva Colombo, Zillion, and our messaging partner, Textware. And we've also been currently supported for this forum by the National Chamber of Commerce of Sri Lanka, uh, NCCSL. Colombo Chamber of Commerce and Federation Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Sri Lanka. Um, I would also like to kind of thank uh, Wellington Pereira, CEO of Enhancer, for this, uh, for supporting us in terms of you know bringing this uh, uh, session live and all the techno, all the tech technical. Um, let me also move on to um, some of the uh, basics housekeeping uh, rules for today. So we have, uh, uh, we would. Like all panelists on mute, except for uh, whoever is presenting at that moment of time. Um, ideally, we could all switch off the videos for except for the presenter as well, so that uh, when you're when you're presenting, maybe you could switch on your videos, which would improve the bandwidth for everyone. Um, as well as uh, we would like all the participants to use your chat window to direct any questions to the panel. And uh, we would then collate them and uh, uh, summarize them and uh, fire and uh, pass on the questions to the panel during the Q&A session. Next, up, I have uh, uh, the the webinar. Uh, we, say, we we also have the upcoming webinars that we have. Just like to touch on that on the 20th of April. Can we use digitally signed documents to support work from home? It's a very relevant uh, subject area, and uh, we'll be carrying it out again due to uh, kind of you know the presentations we got last year, last time we had it a few weeks, few days back. And on the 23rd of April, we're going to be touching on using advanced analytics for a recovery from COVID. So these are just something to look forward to. Okay, well, uh, let me also kind of touch a little bit on FITIS. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of FITIS, but FITIS is in IT industry, Sri Lanka, an apex body that represents all aspects of the ICT industry. Uh, we represent uh, the, the software chapter, represents all the uh, software development companies, uh, basically for exports or for intellectual property developers, product development companies. Mm, we have the hardware chapter, which represents all the ICT vendors and the system integrators in Sri Lanka who drive digital transformation. We've got the ICT training chapter, which actually takes care of all the institutes that take care of ICT uh, education. We have the ICT professionals. We have the telcos, all the telcos. We have a number of telcos uh, that have registered today. Uh, that 
today and we also have uh, very newly we've also added the digital platforms as well as the office automation chapter so we would like, we would be hearing a lot about some of the digital platforms also who have uh, who have registered for this as well as we have Zulfa from the digital platforms aspect of things um, our core mandate primarily is uh, uh, supporting digital transformation within uh, is one of our core mandates that is essentially um, uh, supporting uh, private sector as well as uh, the citizens of Sri Lanka to uh, to be digitally digitally more enabled and our other core mandate is uh, to to drive intellectual product creation intellectual property creation within Sri Lanka to support both uh, our internal consumption of ICT or internal consumption of software as well as uh, for uh, so these are our two core mandates and uh, event today is fundamentally uh, to support all these industries, all these sectors within the ICT industry. So we could actually come out of this, uh, you know, with the least uh, amount of, uh, you know, uh, damage, I would call it. Uh, so, so, and uh, basically be ready to uh, take Sri Lanka to uh, digitally take Sri Lanka forward. So we have over, like I mentioned earlier, we have over 750 participants registered for this program. Let me kick off uh, this session today with a very brief introduction. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is unlike any crisis we have ever faced before. At a global scale, it is unprecedented uh, and beyond comprehension. And many experts have envisaged a very different world that we will return to. Once we get better or for worse, we will have to wait and see. Uh, one thing is for certain, there is no business that actually can hide from the challenges ahead, uh, be it IT, be it uh, And uh, uh, so let me just bring some clarity to the objectives of this program today. Our elite lineup of panelists have gathered today to give you an insight on where the industry currently stands in terms of how each segment is currently affected. Uh, what we should expect in the coming months, you know, uh, even though we could uh, re be released from uh, repercussions that we will see ahead of us and most importantly uh, we will hear from our panelists today as to how we could navigate these troubled waters and uh, we would and also possibly some guidance on how to face the upcoming challenges so uh, and most importantly obviously there in addition to challenges you've also got opportunities as is with any crisis you have inevitably some opportunities being created and how do we actually exploit these opportunities so therefore i would have a request for the panelists to uh, summarize each of your discussions uh, with a few key takeaway points as well as a few key action points for the benefit of the audience so the ado uh, pass uh, to introduce our keynote speaker for today mr jayant uh, mr jayant silva the, the chairman of ic to uh, to give us uh, a brief uh, uh, out uh, to give us a brief understanding on his outlook on the challenges and uh, opportunities uh, during this period. Panther, uh, over to you. Okay, thanks, Abbas. Hope you can hear me uh, very clearly. Okay, thank you, uh, Fritis and um, Ian Bai, for setting this up, and and really grateful for Fritis for setting up this discussion. Um, as you know, as Abbas said, I mean, there are no two words to describe the challenges that we are in. Um, a lot of people describe these challenges and say that we are worse than uh, worse than the World War II. Uh, but let's let's look at it. I mean, let's first look at it. Uh, I just want to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, four months ago, you know, when the COVID-19 uh, was not there. Uh, how successful we were. Uh, as you know, uh, I mean, most of us in Sri Lanka, most of our companies who are participating have come the hard way. No doubt about that. Uh, so, I mean, four months ago, we never even thought that there would be a challenge like this. Uh, why is this challenge so, so, uh, so uh, great? Um, 
first of all, I would go, I'll try to take an example of uh, my own company. Give me two minutes, IFS. Uh, we came to Sri Lanka uh, when actually things were not that good. Uh, uh, very honestly, things were as bad as today. But there was a major difference. The major difference is that, uh, you know, the, the problem that we faced in Sri Lanka was uh, very unique to us. And uh, our, our friends in Sweden, uh, of course, they were doing very well. So we would look up to them and say, OK, uh, we could even say, OK, please help us. Though, the, though, the, though we didn't take that attitude, I mean, you could say that. Uh, but today, there's a major problem because uh, if you take the supplier and the customer uh, or vendor like us and the customer, uh, sometimes the customer is more affected than the vendor. Uh, so we have a huge problem. I'll take uh, Emirates. Emirates is one of our customers. Emirates today have grounded all their planes. So Emirates says that uh, they are in a worse position than IFS. So we have a huge problem here. But, but the only, only consolation that I could say is the problem is same to all of us in the world. And some of our customers, some of our countries are doing bad and worse than us. Being a small country, right, we are, we are sort of doing fairly okay, I would say. But let's see what we can do. As we all know, I don't have to tell very much, you know, we are going through huge challenges, right? And we are looking for opportunities. In this game, there are no magic formulas. So I, I can't give a magic formula, unfortunately. There are no magic formulas for us, right? Now, why do a customer come to you? I would ask a question, why do a student, why does a student go to SLIT rather than another university? Uh, why do I buy, B, I buy IBM or HP uh, rather than any other? You know, we, what happens is we have already, I mean, this is a normal thing that we all know. We have built our differentiators. So the differentiators are the things that actually right helps you to attract your customers so in a case like this actually it's high time that we first think like a customer that rather than a supplier okay we were a customer what would do you do in these circumstances so let's let's look at the differentiators now the differentiators that we should build should be very strong very very as it calls it should be very different but it's a tough call for us as i said our our customer is also affected like us or worst affected so can we can we survive let's look at it again now say large companies traditionally what they do is actually they subcontract subcontract within the country or subcontract to us. You may call by it by any name, right? It's subcontract. Now, most of the companies today, including IFS, is looking inward. And they think the subcontracting should be stopped. Or we should buy the small companies. Because large companies do have funds and they could buy any company that they want. I mean, small companies. So the small companies are facing a huge problem. So what can we do today as small companies, as a small country? We should obviously, we can say a lot of things, right? But actually, we have a huge challenge. We need money to sustain. I'm not going into detail like, you know, we can do, uh, I mean, e-education, e, e, e e-health, right, robotics, AI. You all know about it. I don't, you can ask questions about it. But what I'm going to do is talk about some realistic solutions that we can do. 
here unfortunately or fortunately we have to look at some of the people who can fund us right so we as ICTA, we are trying our very best we are having a meeting on tuesday with the banks i think the banks still have the capacity to help us right so we need as an industry to look at the uh, look at uh, uh, the government and get the government help to help us in this direction because otherwise unfortunately if it goes well beyond three months we will a lot of light of a lot of companies like you i know will have a problem just paying the salaries but i really don't know whether you are aware ifa uh, ICTA is of course starting our normal routine from monday so we are going into office from monday and we are started starting working with the help of the government the government has given the okay and looks like right we are going to have uh, be an example to the others and looks like the system is getting easier in sri lanka so that's some good news at least for us in our country so what can you do what can we do as ICTA? i'm not going into technical details because most of these technical details uh, you all know and our panelists would discuss with you uh, first of all we are going to have a front end for fdi one-stop shop at ICTA, so that we could uh, attract the foreign uh, foreign uh, customers through sometimes through the garment to garment and through to some give uh, uh, confidence the backup the assurance to some of these companies uh, with with you with you as the industry we will have a front end at ICTA where we we would know we will have experts and they could talk to us and we are going to do it the second thing is uh, we are going to open up a new office at ICTA to help the industry to see that resources available and the problems that you face today are brought to us and we try to help the industry, especially the ICT BPM industry. So this is what we are planning and we are opening ICTA from Monday. So that I, I think that's good news to the industry. The, uh, talking about few things. There are a lot of companies again. Where the ownership is going to change. And thereby. Some of the links that you all had with them. Would be broken. This is going to be a major problem. As I said, there are companies who will buy small companies. So as a as a main uh, apex body of Sri Lanka, we are going to integrate lot of other agencies and help you in this case because it's when as a as ICTA, you would be I am sure we would be able to help you. Further, I would like to say that most of the agencies that we have discussed, uh, financial institutes have given us some very good uh, positive uh, input to us. So that's again a, a, a good news to all of you. So I'm not going to into detail. I would prefer you all ask me questions uh, because the panelists would discuss separate separately to you all. So this is the confidence I can give you as ICTA. The others, I mean, I'm, I know 100% you you all were aware of the situation. But let's uh, let me pass on to the panelists now and then later, please ask some specific questions that I can help you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jayanta, for that uh, very thought thoughtful uh, introduction. Uh, 
and uh, we would next like to move on to uh, our next panelist. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Arjuna Herat uh, from uh, ENY. Uh, I would like uh, to ask Arjuna to uh, to give us uh, a brief. Over to you, Arjuna. Thank you. Thank you, Abbas. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. So great. Thank you very much uh, to FITES um, and all the panelists uh, who are here today uh, for uh, this session because I think it's a very important and uh, a critical session uh, in the midst of a crisis uh, that we are going through. Uh, I must uh, also recognize uh, Mr. Jayanta De Silva, Chairman of ICTA, uh, for his comments. Uh, I must say that there were two significant things he mentioned uh, in, for me in my mind. Uh, one thing is about the customers being affected and the industry is affected as a result of that. Uh, and I believe uh, these are a few of the challenges that the industry faces. Of course, I personally believe that uh, industry may have more opportunities than challenges in the current context, uh, but clearly uh, the customers being affected is clearly uh, a challenge that the industry will face. That would mean maintaining scale that you have, uh, maintaining the capacity you have in the short run, and I'm hoping that in the medium to longer term uh, that will get resolved. Uh, we've already seen some limitations on imports uh, will that affect the industry? And I'm sure it uh, is there to intervene in this. Uh, and I think this is a very important industry uh, to ensure that the inputs are not restricted, limited uh, to the industry. Uh, and of course, the mobility is affected. So your interaction with the clients, the customers, uh, a lot of the time you may need to really have physical interaction <clears throat> with the customers in doing some of your work. And these are some of the challenges uh, that I feel, but I <clears throat> I want to talk more around opportunities than challenges because I believe uh, that's the case uh, for uh, the industry. I think uh, technology industry, in my mind, uh, would be uh, one of the most significant industries that in fact have opportunities uh, in the current context. Uh, I also must congratulate uh, uh, Jayanta for uh, the concept of a one-stop shop at ICTA. Uh, to attract investments and to help the industry. I think uh, a very much needed uh, initiative, which in fact can propel this industry uh, to its um, heights and the potential it has. <clears throat> uh, I just want to quickly get to, I, I think I believe I have anything between five to 10 minutes and I don't want to take too much of time because we can talk around some of these stuff uh, during a panel discussion. But I think I would like to talk about some of the opportunities that in fact has come. I think the world that we are living now is has changed a lot within the last few months to few few weeks to few months. Uh, you yourself and we ourselves when you look at it, uh, how we worked, how we um, interacted with others to how we um, really went around buying our supplies to whatnot. Everything uh, has changed, isn't it? Uh, and some of these changes and shifts, I believe, will will persist and we will get entrenched in our daily life. Um, and I feel uh, many market sectors will re-emerge. Many new market sectors will re-emerge, and there will be new market realities in my mind. Uh, if you just, I want to give a few examples. Uh, if you talk about us personally, um, uh, we continue to work from home. Uh, and I must say uh, productivity from our perspective at Ernst & Young and what we've done has been as good as what it could be. Of course, we are lucky that we had ongoing work and we're trying to execute that work uh, uh, productively and efficiently. And I must say the clients are responding and uh, we have managed to maintain that productivity we actually had or even better that productivity uh, because people are at home and in fact they are working long hours uh, and actually we are gaining more productivity. Of course our, 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 our challenge is that 
you know, will we have new work uh, when we come out of this? And how do we really get to that? Uh, is the real uh, anxiety we have at this moment? Um, uh, if you really talk, so that entire work modality uh, has changed, work mechanism has changed. And in fact, we are now talking about reducing our office space and in fact, having more people work from home. Uh, and that was never the case. We, even though a lot of industries thought about it, uh, since we were not pushed to it, we never really experimented in the manner that we have really worked today. And we have got many tools in our hands and we and there are new tools being developed. And I believe this whole work mechanism will change, which would mean in fact, uh, more female workers uh, may come into the labor force uh, to having opportunities to have in increased productivity as a result of people as well is something that we are uh, going to see as far as we can see. Uh, if you talk about your personal, um, you know, um, supplies to home, uh, how you really go about uh, getting your supplies, I think that's going to change hell of a lot. Uh, I, I must say the examples were that the small timers, the, the small traders, in fact, has been exploiting this opportunity because we found that the bigger retailers uh, had a jam uh, as a result of uh, bombardment of uh, requirements and requests uh, that actually small timers came into the fore. Uh, today you have scenarios where you actually WhatsApp uh, your list of uh, supplies you need uh, and the vendors in fact taking photographs of their uh, available supplies and sending it to you, to you to decide whether you really want some of those stuff, whether they are good quality. Uh, and that mechanism, I feel, can expand with technology to be a bit more sophisticated. Uh, now it's more simple, uh, it is more uh, elementary, um, and I, I feel that uh, there is opportunity to use technology to, in fact, uplift the small time traders uh, to levels that we have never seen. Uh, today we have a a lorry that comes uh, full of uh, curd uh, from Hammantota, uh, collecting all the curd deep down south, full of curd in the um, lorry. And I must say that they uh, they have prefixed orders to sell that entire lot. And I feel the Hammantota uh, curd producers, in fact, may be having a better uh, situation now than what it was. So I think there are opportunities for consolidated to cons bring come about and actually consolidate the small timers to be able to actually flourish. And SME sector, I believe, has an opportunity to uh, flourish. Um, I also see if you talk about education uh, today, my son is just after O levels. Uh, he has just started his A level classes. We started the classes, and every tuition master who actually we started classes before the A level classes started is actually recording uh, their sessions and WhatsApping uh, to the students and the assignments are WhatsApp again. Uh, they do the assignments uh, and email uh, and that entire process of tuition uh, has completely changed. And that would mean, uh, of course, we just um, heard from uh, Lalit offline uh, how his university is actually doing uh, what he's doing. But I believe uh, there is an opportunity for our entire education uh, uh, modality uh, to completely change, which in fact can bring more effective uh, learning uh, as well as um, uh, dissemination of knowledge. Uh, I must say that we never experience of uh, platforms, uh, seminars of this nature. Sometimes we struggle to get 100 people for a seminar. Uh, today you have a webinar. Uh, today I think we have close to 500 people on this webinar. Uh, we had a, a webinar with the Institute of Chartered Accounts of India, uh, 60,000 across the world. It was across the world webinar on accounting and finance. 60,000, they ran it on three platforms, YouTube, you know, Microsoft Teams and so on. The total consolidated number was 60,000. It was amazing. Uh, so I believe uh, the entire modality of uh, us uh, going about has changed and it will change and it's too it'll it'll last long and it'll it'll actually stick to it'll it'll be things that we will actually uh, will work with uh, health services clearly is going to change uh, today we have uh, tools and apps developed 
uh, to actually diagnose and uh, and also manage the entire COVID-19. And we believe that's going to uh, continue to happen on a lot of the healthcare service delivery. Um, so so I, I, I just want to sort of, I, I, I just thought I'll just let you know those aspects because I think the industry has opportunities in this current context. And I think industry must come together uh, to exploit those opportunities. I must say the consumer is ready. The consumer and the customers, the end customers are ready. I must just say one more thing before I really, sort of possibly before I really move on, uh, at least log off. Uh, we actually did for one of our clients uh, a survey of finding out how do we serve the unbanked underserved or unbanked. So we went to the lagging regions, which is in fact Sabaragamua, Uva, North and East. So we went from places like Tanna, Velioya, uh, Vellavaya, Ampara, Karavanchikudi, and so on and so forth. Uh, the beetle farmer in Velioya or Ampara actually looks at his, he's, he's a sarang person wearing a sarang, bearded gentleman of 60 years old, is actually doing his beetle leaf uh, sales being on Facebook. He looks at his uh, pricing on Facebook. He looks at his market on Facebook and we were asking him, where do you do banking? He said, my bank is 10 kilometers away and for me it's very inconvenient to go. And we asked, will you, if you have an app, will you really uh, use it? He says, definitely. We do, we use apps a lot here. And he's a person who talks in Tamil. And I might say we through a translator we spoke. And uh, we we are convinced the last mile customer, the last mile consumer that you have is ready for technology. Uh, and I, I must say that a lot of the time the bigger, the retailers and the bankers thought that they need to increase the footprint uh, in branch of branches uh, to uh, the retail outlets. And that was the thinking that existed. And today's scenario that has emerged has convinced, I think, the retailers and the bankers that that should not be the case and it should be technology to reach the last mile customer. So I think uh, opportunities, I believe, are fairly there, uh, but very in the very short term, I think we might have to manage the challenges that come. And I believe we must rally around uh, to really change the game uh, for the country and for our customers. Uh, I think government is a big time player in this. Uh, we must get into transforming government uh, using technology. I think ICTA is uh, having a lot of uh, sort of talks around that. I think that's going to happen. A uh, government must completely reorganize the local supply net network integrating with digital platforms. Uh, and I think uh, if they take the lead, uh, that will create opportunities uh, for the local industry. And I think that will uh, create an immense uh, transformation uh, of the industry and the country. So about with those few words, uh, let me hand it over and I'm sure some of this stuff can get discussed uh, by the panelists. And hopefully uh, if there are Q&A and if there are some questions around that, we'll come back to uh, sure. th that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Arjuna. Uh, that was uh, a very informative kind of uh, discussion on the real opportunities that we need to focus on. Uh, with that, I'd like to move on to uh, maybe hearing uh, uh, Professor Lal, President and CEO of Sri Lanka SLIT, to on his thoughts in five minutes, his thoughts as to uh, on the subject matter. So, uh, Professor Gamage, uh, over to you. Uh, I would request you to switch on your video, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Abbas. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Fitis, for inviting me uh, to be a panelist. Uh, I think I consider this as a great opportunity. Um, like um, Arjuna, I would also like to first talk about the opportunities. Um, I, I'll talk about a few opportunities and also then um, some of the challenges uh, that uh, we are facing um, as an edu as um, edu educators, the education industry. 
I think uh, if you really look at um, uh, the first opportunity that we have is, uh, you know, we've been always trying to provide higher education to a wider section of the society. Um, you know, uh, as most of you may know, we have over 180,000 A-level students qualifying to enter a university. Uh, the government universities has about less than 30,000 places and the private sector may be taking another 10,000 or so. We were always wondering whether this model, delivery of lectures uh, through online mechanisms would work and we never tried this before. However, we were preparing for this uh, from um, April last year. We were really wondering what if uh, that continued? How do we continue our you know, business? Um, so we were actually gearing up to this uh, since April uh, last year. So because of that, we were ready. And from, I must tell you, um, from 18th of uh, November, we started delivering all our lectures um, online. And uh, I must tell you, it was a huge success. And more than we anticipated, our students really liked it. They praised us and they embraced this technology. So we actually have not lost a single day of classes uh, because of this closure. And now, what we should look at is we have capacity. So all of a sudden we have enough capacity and we can expand further uh, by using this technology to access to provide access to education to a wider section of the society. So this is, I think, I will consider that that's a great opportunity. The second opportunity um, that I would like to um, bring to you is um, is saving of foreign exchange. If I tell you some of the numbers, you might um, not even believe me because, uh, you know, the, um, uh, we have about 12,000 students going overseas uh, to study in, in foreign universities. And if you do a, uh, see the, this amount, the amount that they take um, for a given year is over 80 billion rupees and the unfortunate thing is the entire higher education sector budget is less than that amount so if we can save some money because of this mobility uh, restriction i think th there's a great opportunity for us to partner with some of these high-ranking universities because they are also struggling they are also trying to uh, come up with new models of uh, delivering their degree programs so this is a great opportunity for educa um, education providers to team up and offer some of their programs in Sri Lanka. Um, or, um, so this will obviously um, retain, as you know, uh, children are afraid to go, parents are afraid to send their children abroad. So this, during this, at least for a while, if we can retain these students, the models will change and we can continue that model and partner with uh, um, high-ranking universities. This also will give us opportunities to attract um, good lecturers, uh, particularly the diaspora uh, who are working in uh, top-notch universities around the world to deliver lectures um, in our institutions. And another opportunity that we see is uh, within the same thing, uh, is to offer our programs. Now, we've been trying to offer uh, some of our programs um, uh, um, at offshore locations like in Bangladesh and so on, but the cost was prohibitive. We were not able to send lecturers and so on. But with this method, we know that we this will also enable us to start uh, offshore campuses. I think in a sense, what we are trying to do is this will, if we work this thing out right, this will be a great opportunity for us to develop Sri Lanka as an education hub. The third thing that I want to say is, as um, I think uh, Jayant and Arjuna mentioned, everyone is going through this, right? And everyone who is well, better prepared will win the, you know, um, day. 
So how do we do this? I think if you really look at this is the time for us to create a good pool of talent. If you look at recent news, Japan is pulling out of China and they are looking at uh, various locations to establish their companies. Uh, they have considered Vietnam, they are considering other countries, but I think when they consider, they would look at countries where there is talent. And this is a very good opportunity because you have Sri Lankan students uh, studying without losing uh, you know, their education. We have uh, Sri Lankans who have gone abroad, who have returned. So we, this is a very good opportunity for us to create a good talent pool. The other thing that I want to say is um, uh, this is also a good opportunity for the IT industry uh, with the support of ICT agency um, to create, uh, to develop exportable products. Um, as uh, uh, Jayantha mentioned, um, we discussed this um, um, in very detail, how we would look at um, government uh, providing government, uh, go providing IT solutions to the government. And we have taken a board level decision to give first priority to uh, Sri Lankan companies, whether it is a company or, or consortia of companies, it doesn't matter the companies uh, that have branches in the regions. I think we will definitely give all large projects to Sri Lankan companies wherever possible. I think that's a very good news for, so this will also help uh, us um, uh, to, you know, bridge the, allow this, uh, allow your, our companies to ride this wave and also many other opportunities which I will address. But let me talk um, uh, um, some of the challenges that we face. As uh, you know, um, lots of uh, people have got, uh, you know, their salaries are cut. Uh, some have been laid off. So, I mean, these are our parents, right? Parents of our students. Uh, we are not sure how they would kind of fund themselves or how the parents could fund their children. So this is something uh, that we have to be concerned of. And, and we also would like to come up with some solutions. Then the other one is we know that the IT sector is affected. And uh, when we graduate our students, whether they would be able to find employment whether they would be able to find um, training opportunities or whether this would send bad signals, wrong signals to the student population that they would not take up you know, this kind of course. So these are some of the challenges that we need to address. But I think we are also discussing how to um, uh, address these challenges. Uh, one is, uh, you know, there is uh, this government interest-free loan scheme. And we are now working with the government to see whether that interest-free loan scheme could be expanded to uh, students who are currently studying in universities as well. So, as I said, uh, if we if you also have you know this um, ICTA floated projects given to companies, we would also like to see uh, these companies employ you know local talent and our students. And also, we are. I was talking to Madhu. Uh, how do we retain? Um, these students, how do how can we keep them in focus? We are also planning to launch some bridging programs after their graduation so that they can be engaged in the IT sector. So these are some of the um, um, opportunities, uh, the challenges. I think we should look at the challenges more positively and the countries who are well prepared will come out of this good. And this is like I'm saying like hitting the reset button and everyone is equal now. Whoever who is going to be, you know, booted up first will win the race. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. I think you've shared some key insightful pointers for the education sector, not only for the ICT education sector, but also for the education sector at large. So I'm sure uh, I, have, I certainly have some questions for you, but we'll take it up at the Q&A session. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Mr. Madhu Ratnayaka, CIO of Vartuza, uh, who will touch up uh, essentially the, the, the whole exports uh, of Sri Lanka and uh, on that subject area. So I would like to uh, 
request Madhu to take the stage. Then, Thank you, Abbas. Uh, okay. I hope you guys can hear me. Very clearly, Madhu. Can you put, switch on your video, please? Sir? It's on. OK, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, this is really uh, uh, opportune topic and thanks for organizing Abbas and team. Uh, you know, I'm delighted to be here um, sharing some thoughts. I, I think it's clearly we are in unprecedented times, right? If you look at the global picture, the ILO talks about uh, COVID-19 will have uh, impact about uh, job losses of about 200 million jobs will be lost, right? And and that kind of doubles the global unemployment rates for about 400 million, which is which is really going down to the periods that we had at the Great Depression. And if you uh, look at the predictions of IMF, the global economy will contract or reduce by about nine trillion dollars. So clearly, I think we are we are headed towards uh, 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 globally uh, almost like a recessionary time, and and I think it's very important that uh, we figure out how we um, how we come back, how we bounce back through that. Right, while there is always uh, massive challenges, uh, there is always great opportunities uh, in any any uh, challenge of this nature, like Giant uh, uh, explained uh, uh, as well. So, so I, I think I want to kind of share with you uh, three. Um, uh, trends or three changes or three awakenings or three new no three new normals that I I see uh, really coming coming together. Some of them, which uh, Nalit also alluded to, uh, you know, typically some of these fundamental shifts or awakening, if you like, will take years to happen. Right, ten years for something to change, whether it's a religious force or political force or some other force will drive us to change. But when you have when you have a disaster in front of you, or when you have a uh, when your life is at threatened, a lot of changes will happen very very rapidly, right? In a, what would would take ten years to change your mindset in four weeks, you you change that, and we see that happening, right? So if you look at that, I, I kind of break down this to three three trends or three awakenings. The first one is a we have a globally worldwide a digital awakening, right? And I think. Uh, Arjuna also talked uh, talk to this and, and people are doing anything from home, right? Whether it's a work from home, shop from home, bank from home, learn from home, um, whatever from home is a new paradigm, right? I think people are really getting beyond um, the phobia of using digital technology to be able to do that because the necessity is driving that, right? So, the, uh, so any of these industries, any of these businesses who are direct to consumer, this is really the time and, and really, you know, you can see that if you look at, uh, uh, you know, your poster boy direct to consumer company, which is Amazon, if you look at the last four weeks, uh, Amazon stock went from about being about $1,800 to $2,400 today, which is a 33% increase in, in the company's valuation, right, over, over four weeks, unprecedented. Um, work will change dramatically as we all see that, you know, we are working from home as we return back. Obviously, new normal will be more work from home. Um, there will be more contract work as more people probably lose opportunities on full time work. Uh, the gig economy will really bounce, accelerate, right? You know, people will come for a gig and go back. So a lot of the trends that uh, were coming whether it's online learning, online commerce, online banking, digital banking, digital learning. These trends were going on, right? I think they're getting a real boost and they're really getting a, a massive acceleration because that we consumer has now got adopted and now got switched into it, right? So I think there is tremendous opportunity if any of us are who in direct to consumer businesses, uh, opportunities immense. And challenge is also immense because now you're while you're um, if you're direct to consumer, you all of a sudden your world becomes your uh, customer base, right? No longer it's your geographic boundary. At the same time, you may have been protected uh, in Sri Lanka. Now there will be uh, companies who are global will come to the same consumer, right? So we'll have to really look at both the opportunity and the threat. You know, you can't assume that Sri Lankan consumer will only go for 
education, uh, for example, uh, online education in Sri Lankan university. Obviously, they will now think about how they go overseas or shopping uh, will dramatically shift, right, with the logistics uh, coming in. So uh, there's great opportunity and obviously, obviously challenges will be there as well if you're in a, in a consumer uh, business. If you are not in a direct-to-consumer business, this is, a, this is a great time to rethink your business model to get there, right? So that's, I think, the first first mega trend I think what we are seeing. The second is I think you you will have a environmental awakening, right? I think we can all see um, that uh, uh, the pollution levels come down, the animal activity has gone up significantly, and I saw a message today that we'll be seeing some uh, comets uh, going around as well because the pollution has cleared out. So there is a clearly, and then people see that, right? There is clearly what Greta Thunberg and other environmentalists has been really pushing hard and that a lot of people wasn't seeing. It, you know, four weeks down the line, you see the impact what we're doing on the environment, right? The, the damage that we do to the environment is now very visceral and very clear right in front of you. You can see what four to eight weeks can do uh, if you just stop uh, consuming as we were doing, right? So, so this will definitely have an impact in, again, how people will consume, you know, things like air travel, uh, the what you buy uh, and people will a lot more be conscious about environmental friendly product services uh, as we go. So, so that's another thing that we should really think about, you know, what is the environmental aspect of your business, right? How are you repositioning or readjusting to make sure that you are you are actually planet friendly as a business, right? If you are not already, you know, businesses uh, will get challenged because of consumer preference will shift there, right? The third uh, uh, trend, uh, or I, I would like to call it like a personal awakening, right? And all of us are really sitting home and and, and working or doing whatever we're doing. Uh, think about the way we work, right? Think about, you know, even getting ready to go to work, right? A lot of people dress up, do makeup and all that kind of stuff to go to work. And, and people start realizing, you know, all these efforts that we've been making to present yourself will be very different, right? Think about, your health, right? You know, the slightest thing a lot of us would, would rant to a specialist or go and get, uh, you know, 10 tests done, right? And I think in the last uh, probably eight weeks, we probably had a lot, lot less illnesses and a lot less deaths and clearly a lot less hospital visits, right? And, and certainly that whole um, paradigm of, you know, over dependence on healthcare, over dependent on testing, over dependence on, you know, going every little thing to specialist, those kind of things will change, right? And, and you'll see that people, and then eating out and doing all the stuff, right? You know, people are very happy to uh, eat at home. You know, a lot of people are, uh, you know, planting vegetables and, and doing, uh, you know, trying to be more self-sufficient, getting a lot more health conscious, a lot more mindful about things. And you're seeing that you're really getting into a, a paradigm of uh, more being self-aware, right? I think whether it's a health or whether it's a consumer uh, consumerism, whether it's work, uh, clothing, whatever else that you think about, is really getting uh, getting to the kind of stuff that GPs has been doing, right? You know, they you know live on a you're a lot more content, you consume less, and 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 you're you're a lot more happier, right? Essentially, greed is getting a reset, right? So I think this will again drive. A, a dramatic impact on businesses, dramatic impact on individuals, how we how we do that, right? So that's the kind of the third third awakening I'd like to call. Um, so I, I think there's also as businesses, um, again, I'd, I'd like to share three things, uh, what we should do and what we should think about in, in, in this time. Obviously, first one, first focus for all business leaders should be really uh, weather the storm, right? You really have to get out of this alive, you know, making sure that you really look at your cost, optimize your business, uh, look at your, uh, make sure your, your cash flows are working, your, 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 your cash is king in you know, situations like this, gives you longevity, sustainability of your business, make sure you preserve cash, make sure you work with your customers, don't wait till the customer comes and asks for your reductions or uh, uh, business reductions with you proactively go there and make sure you build the relationships and step out into your customers' uh, shoes like uh, uh, Jayanta was talking about and build that relationship. Use that time to strengthen that relationship, right? And, and, and that's the first one. The first, first order of the priority 
is whether the storm be ready, right? And the other two are opportunities. The second one, obviously, is a we have a phenomenal direct to consume opportunity while we are in lockdown. So if your business has not been direct to consumer, really have to rethink about it. You know, in the next eight weeks, next you know eight weeks to one month, uh, sorry, eight weeks to three months, there's a tremendous opportunity for you to really accelerate. If you're a bank, you know, going digital. Uh, you know, we must have taken five years to try to go digital. This is the time to go digital in four weeks, right? You really have to put all your efforts and energy and do that. If your education like Lalit has done, this is the time to do it, right? You you immediately transform your business into a direct to consumer business. And that applies to anybody. If you're a retailer, how do you go direct to consumer rapidly, right? So, so that's the second big opportunity. In the lockdown, there's a phenomenal direct to consumer opportunity. We really have to think about how to harness that. And the third and final one, is how do you reimagine your business for a new normal, right? The three trends I talk about, if your customers are more digitally awakened, if they are more environmentally conscious, if they are more personally aware, how you, you should uh, reimagine your business for this new normal, right? I think this is the time to really sit back and, and rethink about your business. Are you, are, is your business ready for a new normal? Going digital, going environmentally friendly, going ready for a different type of consumer, and kind of rehashing your DNA and, and setting yourself up for that. So these are, I think, uh, key things I feel we should be doing right now, and we should be uh, planning uh, as we come out of this uh, uh, um, global situation that we are all in. So with that, let me hand over back to Abbas. Thanks, uh, thanks, Madhu. Those were very thought-provoking uh, insights, and uh, I think, uh, especially with regards to actually realigning our businesses, like you mentioned, to the new new norm, it would be an absolute key factor that all organizations would need to look at. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you know all of us will take that back and uh, see how we could actually relook at uh, how how business. COVID. With that, uh, I'd like to next call upon uh, uh, Dr. Naina Dehigama, Chairman and Managing Director of Epic Technology Group. Uh, Naina, uh, over to you and, and uh, your thoughts and insights. Hello. Hello. Nice. All right. Okay. Uh, is it clear now? Voice is yes. Okay? Yes, right. Raina, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Abbas. Uh, thank you, Fitis. Thank you, uh, all the guys who have joined today. And uh, I think uh, it's a fantastic opportunity for us to share our ideas, thoughts uh, in this uh, so called uh, crisis time. I would like to share in my first session uh, the overall um, aspect of what I think what I see, how I see in this scenario. Uh, people talk about uh, crisis ahead of us. And of course, yes, <clears throat> crisis uh, is a, also is also a specific situation, specific state of uh, the market, uh, something which we cannot actually um, uh, control. That is why we call it crisis. So, uh, so therefore, there are many things that, that are not controllable in a crisis situation. But there is something that we can control in a crisis, which is us, how we uh, change ourselves um, to face the challenges uh, that comes uh, from this crisis. So that is how uh, we basically should be doing, because if we, if we try uh, to go uh, head on with the crisis and the challenges that we have and uh, that we basically face, and then of course, you know, we will uh, head, uh, knock our head on a, uh, big stone so uh, we won't go any anywhere so what mostly matters for me is uh, how the companies uh, it companies and not only it companies all the companies be agile to this crisis uh, situation uh, and uh, how strategically we can take a side step and uh, move move uh, change our trajectory differently uh, through transformation and then look for uh, new opportunities that are being created in the crisis market. As uh, the previous 
presented uh, said mm-hmm. there are so much so many opportunities that are created in the crisis market too while we lose the existing or the opportunities that we used to enjoy uh, the crisis market op- opens up many avenues many opportunities for, for entrepreneurs uh, companies to go and uh, exploit and also uh, generate uh, revenue and, uh, and uh, wealth i just want to touch upon a little bit of history uh, if you can remember um, not very far but uh, I, if i talk about uh, the decade of 2000 um, the country was going through a, a very very uh, bad uh, uh, the, the patch there uh, in uh, 2000, if I can remember 2000 to 2003, we had uh, a lot of uh, political unrest in our country. If I'm not mistaken, we changed our government three times. And uh, then uh, for the history, the first time of the history, we recorded minus 1.5 uh, GDP growth at that at that time. So that is a, that was a cri- economic crisis situation internally. Then in 2006, 2007, uh, we uh, faced the Asian uh, market uh, um, falling down in the 2008-2009, we had the global economic meltdown, and that's uh, also that period that we had the intensified uh, civil uh, unrest in the country, the war, and then you know the, the, we basically had to change most of our things. We could not actually behave uh, uh, normally. Yet, yet most of our companies, especially in the IT sector, grew substantially within that. If you look at the the, the um, the uh, statistics, um, including my own company, uh, we have grown during that time more than what we have uh, grown um, in the uh, the normal times in the sense. The way that we did this one, what we did there was uh, actually picking up the niche opportunities created by the crisis market and then quickly go and exploit them. And that gave us a lot of revenue, a lot of revenues, and then of course opportunities for transformation. So this is a similar situation now. The only difference that I see in this situation is that those days we had the depression uh, uh, in the market. But here, depression, um, you may feel, you may see the depression as well as change, which means we may have to change uh, the way we do things now. So again, it is a good good thing in the sense because now now people uh, try to understand what actually uh, is needed. Uh, what are the basics that we really need uh, for us to live? As uh, Madhu very correctly said, of course, you now for slightest thing, you used to you know go and queue up um, to meet consultants, uh, doctors and consultants, and you know paid a hell of a lot of money um, and uh, you know went for all these tests and things like that. But you know. For the last uh, one and a half months, no one went there and then no one uh, died too. So we are okay now. We realize that, you know, all these expenditure that may, we may have done there is unnecessary so that you can actually bring our living standards also uh, back to the back to basics in the sense. So this is another uh, good thing. Also, because of this, uh, the, the epidemic, uh, the, the, the nature of that, this epidemic, my take is that until someone finds a, a vaccine and uh, find a way to eradicate this uh, pandemic or the, the virus spreading from the world, we have to find ways to live with it. We have to find ways to live with it in the sense. And mainly, we have to understand how we can protect ourselves. Is not protecting others first. First, we have to find a ways to pro- protect myself my family, then my organization, then the society, then the country. So that's the way I would, uh, mm-hmm. in fact, look at because if I, what I believe is that if I get myself protected, I can get my family protected. I can, if, then, then I adopt those best practices to my organization. I can get my organization protected. And then that basically talks about the, uh, about protecting the society. So we have to find ways, we have to adopt practices how we can actually survive, how we can live uh, in this uh, pandemic or or, or challenging situation. So in a way, that is very good because now we will adopt good practices to our life and we will understand that uh, the simplicity is the beauty, is the uh, thing that we all want. 
And we also will understand that only certain thing in this world is the uncertainty. The uncertainty is only certainty uh, in the world. So therefore, uh, we, will, we also will realize that all these scientific uh, the, uh, predictions, forecasting, and all these things does not have much value uh, in situation like this. You know, we, have, we, we used to depend ourselves on, on those scientific predictions, scientific forecasting. So these scientific things, are how much of value that it can create actually for us. But main thing is the, the preparedness, how well we are prepared to uh, face the unexpected. So we have to always expect the unexpected when basically doing the study. So I think the coming back to uh, the overall picture, what matters now uh, I'm particularly focusing on how to survive in the next 12 months. What matters now is strategy. Strategy means nothing else but how you utilize your scarce resources in an effective manner to gain competitive advantage in the market. So that's mm -hmm. all about strategy. And if you do that one, if you bring, bring down your, uh, the, uh, the operational expenditures, uh, if you if you adopt simplicity and uh, cut your frills and understand what are your basics, then uh, go look uh, through the window, look at look outside, and then understand the the, the opportunities that have been created in, in outside, and then uh, go pick them, do whatever the changes that you want to do inside. Uh, as I told, uh, you know, uh, be uh, uh, bold enough to. Uh, change your tra tra trajectory, but in a in a strategic way, mm. rather than you know investing uh, heavily on uh, changing your trajectory. Probably you can look at your in inside what your core competencies, distinct competencies that we have, and uh, what is your knowledge base, and how you can mix and match those resources to come out with new innovations, uh, which are applicable. Uh, and suitable for the new opportunity, niche opportunities created in this crisis market, right? Now, those are the things that the entrepreneurs have to now think about. And uh, of course, having said that, uh, I would like to uh, point out some specifics, if the time permits, in uh, in probably my uh, next uh, you know uh, discussion. So therefore, I just wanted to um, leave at this, and uh, I can go into deeper because I'm not only. Um, uh, want to talk about only the high level, but if anyone wants to understand what my specifics for these specific situations still I'm I'm willing to discuss. So thank you very much, and I will uh, 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 give the session back to the moderator. Abbas. Sorry, thank you, yeah. uh, thank you, Naina. Very insightful thought, and uh, I think that uh, um, to summarize, I think uh, be bold is is interestingly a very uh, a very important or a very very important mindset that we need to have. I think uh, to not only survive but to you know thrive in this uh, in this crisis. So thank you for that, Naina, and. I'd like to next move on to uh, Riza Wadud, country manager of IBM, uh, to take the stage and uh, to give us um, your insights uh, as to what your thoughts on how we take this uh, uncertain future up. Uh, Riza, over to you. Uh, thanks, Abbas, uh, and thanks to FITIS and e ENY for organizing this event and for inviting me. Uh, also, good evening to everyone uh, on the webinar. Uh, so I think we heard a lot uh, about uh, from a different and um, from different contexts in terms of uh, where we are and where we are heading to. Um, so from a technology perspective, from a technology company perspective, um, and we heard about you know how things are changing, and for us, uh, this time is kind of an interim normal for us. Um, the new normal is yet to be seen. So we are not probably going to go back to where we were four months ago. We'll probably head into something of a mix of where we were and what we learned in the last maybe four or five months. 
So businesses are really going to relook at how they did business, what did they learn, and what can they do better when they come out of this situation. So for us, it's changing a lot of things. What we were thinking of doing as offerings or taking to the market uh, beginning of the year is not what we can do now. All right. So what all this is driving to is that technology is only becoming an enabler and a game changer for all businesses. I think that's what everyone is talking about, right? So given that technology is critical, right? How do we as technology companies really gear ourselves to adapt and support the businesses that really need to change? So coming from yeah, come a, from a, taking from a global perspective, I know IBM has been, um, you know, gearing to work from home and having all these uh, flexible work policies, all that. But we have not seen such an extreme situation, right? So everything changes with this, right? Uh, starting from even the management system, right? How do we engage with the people? How do we bring teams together? Uh, how do we communicate? What are the metrics that we would use to really drive productivity? See, all of these things are changing for us now in terms of running the business, right? So I think from Jayanta to Arjuna to Madhu, even Professor Lalit, um, you know, Nayan, everybody spoke about, you know, what can we do, right? Um, in terms of what we see, right? Um, and what we see is that uh, the necessity will drive uh, the digital transformation that we all were expecting, right? And I think lots of organizations have been looking at how do we digitize, how do we transform, how do we really set up our processes to really drive end-to-end -end transformation. So this necessity will drive a lot of the transformation, whether we like it or not. And if done properly, it's not only going to help us during this time to revive and survive during this time, but also to bring a lot more benefits when we come out of this situation. So for us, it was about realigning what we would take, what we would or how we would help organizations to adapt, to revive and to sustain. So looking at what's happening around, um, what we are really seeing is that lots of organizations are re-looking at what they're learning during this time. And I think some of the things even Arjuna, you mentioned about, you know, do we really need to go back to the concept of everybody coming into office? Can some people work from home, right? So those are thoughts that are now coming to a lot of organizations about how do we leverage the extended teams, remote teams, right? Or even Professor Larit, you spoke about, you know, how do we even take certain offerings to different markets or engaging resources from different markets? So all of this new thinking is now coming about when we are thinking of the new normal, right? So what we are seeing as coming out of this situation, what's really going to be likely is that everyone is going to be looking at how do we radically lower the cost structures? I think, I mean, whether we like it or not, that's something every organization is going to be looking at, right? How do we really ensure the operational resiliency, right? Um, and extreme digitization, right? Leveraging, you know, the cloud, you know, intelligent process automation, AI and so on, right? Um, and I think Madhu, you spoke about uh, in terms of how do we engage with clients also are going to change given that people are going to, you know, relook at how they do business, right? So how do we reinvent the customer relationships, right? And with all of this digital transformation and all the work that's going to happen, we are also going to see a lot more uh, security related issues, right? So we are going to see a different set of problems 
coming out of this for the technology industry to solve. So I think what's important for us is that to rethink what's going to be required in the new normal right, and be relevant and to be essential to those businesses when that's going to happen. Right. So from a from a kind of a high level perspective, right, um, we, we will see a lot more, you know, uh, ecosystems evolving, uh, a lot more organizations focusing on how they can leverage uh, the ecosystem rather than, you know, them depending on trying to do everything themselves, right? And that will drive, you know, integration not within the organization, but within industries or within value chains. And that's some of the problems that we are seeing today, right? Because although we have supplies and we have uh, customers and we have the organizations, but we don't see the end-to-end -end integration in the value chain of the supply chain. As a result, you know, we are having issues in terms of meeting the demands of the current situation, right? So all of these things put together, I think it's a huge opportunity for the technology organizations to really step up and to really adapt and to bring the right offerings and to help organizations get through this problem and to also sustain the developments they do during this time. So with that, I'll turn over to um, Abbas and maybe if there are more questions we can take up during the session. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Riza. Uh, I believe that perspective uh, from him on an international uh, base. Uh, we next have uh, Jeffrey Zulfer, founder and CEO of PickMe, and I'm sure everyone will see, I mean, uh, we've seen digital platforms really come to the forefront, and I'm sure everyone's uh, waiting to hear from Zulfer as to what his thoughts are on, on the upcoming challenges. Um, Zulfer, over to you. Yeah, hi Abbas. Uh, thank you uh, so much for inviting me uh, to speak at this webinar. Uh, I think, uh, let, let me first talk about the, the challenges, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, though, though it's an opportunity for digital companies, uh, but I think there is still challenges for companies, for essentially companies, right? Uh, and, I, and, I, and, and, for the, and, the, and for the startup community, I think uh, this is a very challenging time. There are big decisions to be made. Uh, and I want to sort of reflect on what we did as a company uh, internally, right? Uh, and uh, one of the first things we wanted to make sure is that we protect the company, right? I think a lot of the entrepreneurs out there must be thinking, oh, now what do I do? You know, uh, you know, it's been almost a month uh, since we've been working from home. You know, uh, we, we still have our rents that needs to be paid in office that we are never using. Uh, we have electricity bills and other statutory payments that needs to be made. And uh, you must be wondering what what are we going to do? I think uh, uh, I, I think I think the, the I think how we looked at it is what do we do to protect the company, right? I think that's the most important thing. Uh, uh, like Naina said, you know, it is important you protect your family first, and then you see how you can protect your uh, uh, your organization, and then obviously the country. I think we 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 sort of uh, realize how important it is to become self-sufficient, right? Uh, right. So, so as a company, I think it's for, for all the entrepreneurs, we need to think about how do we protect the company so that we can continue the good work we've done. Then I think uh, on, the, on the same time, uh, you know, uh, yes, the the COVID has created uh, an environment that has completely changed, right? And and obviously there's there's that opportunity. Uh, there are certain opportunities that have opened up now. Uh, but but as companies, as startup, as in the startup, as startup companies you need to make sure that you cross this line, you know, maybe survive in the next two, three months, right? Because that's important. And, and we made sure that we put in certain, uh, uh, we carried out certain exercises to make sure uh, that we survive at least the next two months, right? Because our revenues have gone down actually, right? We, you know, we, we had a ride hailing uh, business that was booming. Uh, and today we have literally no taxi rides on the platform, right? But obviously we pivoted fast and we obviously have uh, a, a, a booming uh, delivery world that has now evolved uh, and obviously uh, and that's growing. So now we need to change focus. We need to change people's roles and ensure that we sort of evolve into this new world that we have now created for ourselves. 
but i think overnight you know we don't have the revenues to cover our costs and we have to make sure that we take out certain uh, we take out certain initiatives to protect that and that's what uh, we have done then for uh, then as opportunities i think uh, as a company you know we want to keep our investors happy our stakeholders happy and and we want to make sure that uh, we present a great uh, story for for them as well right i think uh, we we were blessed that you know uh, the government institutions like uh, satosa litrogas wanted to work with us and and we were able to quickly uh, roll them uh, roll uh, roll their products out and we could essentially deliver products to households uh, through the, our platform which i think was a great initiative by the government right and i think we expect more of that as we as we go along to be uh, to support the local uh, enterprises to be able to uh, you know get those services across to the people uh, and, and i think uh, the icda chairman should look at this as an opportunity to embrace local technology companies to evolve and and make a difference i think uh, all all uh, as you look back in history uh, incidents like this have actually brought new companies uh, to the horizon and i think we as a as an industry will have to look at uh, this as an as an opportunity and see how we can evolve to 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 create great companies uh, in our country that will create more jobs uh, for the people of our country so uh, i mean when i see one of the things about when you speak class is that you have you know some of the other speakers end up speak uh, talking about your topic so i don't want to uh, uh, talk too much uh, i I'll, i'll pass the 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 mic back to uh, abbas thanks thanks Zulfu, for that uh, very interesting uh, point of view from uh, from the platforms and from pikmi uh, i would next uh, call upon on uh, uh, who's uh, definitely uh, last but definitely not the least speaker for uh, giving his uh, briefing to us ginsar uh, adas country manager of uh, hp sri lanka over to you Hello. Uh, can you hear me, Abbas? Yes. Yeah, and I'm just presenting. I've just done few slides uh, for the benefit of the audience. Can you see my screen as well? Yes, we can. All right. Okay. So, uh, coming uh, from another multinational, I think if you take Sri Lanka business, we had uh, key few challenges. I mean, uh, starting from February up to date. i think uh, the main challenge that we saw encountered was uh, business environment becoming very dynamic and as opposed to the business capabilities whether we are keeping up in the local business context this was one of the major uh, the concern uh, or a challenge that we have faced and at the same time we were focusing on uh, business continuity protocols uh, especially we saw on, on the, across the industries uh, we saw uh, even small and medium companies are adopting uh, these change using various platforms uh, taking products to uh, during lockdown situation and that has that has been and but if you take the bigger companies we have seen uh, many challenges where uh, the company itself is taking time uh, of implementing uh, uh, the uh, the the uh, op- uh, uh, focusing on the opportunities to uh, uh, scale up capabilities at the same time Uh, we have seen uh, remo- uh, mobility and remote productivity let me give a little bit of context towards this uh, i've actually we have been working with idc very closely uh, monitoring the imports to sri lanka if you look at uh, uh, fi19 we approximately for a quarter uh, we have been shipping about uh, 70000 notebooks and uh, laptops and desktops to the market and but uh, if you look at of the total about 47% is uh, is meant for a uh, commercial sector out of this for 47% uh, we have seen 64% are business desktops which are which are deployed to the corporate sector this is actually a one reason where the remote productivity and mobility has been a challenge and moving on towards the logistics i think again bringing some context towards it i mean uh, if you look at uh, uh, in in late january uh, the covid 19 hit china uh, 
uh, most of our production plants are in China. So if you take in month of February, we didn't have any production coming in. And uh, if you take up to date, our desktop factory is just uh, uh, open up in Hubei. And uh, notebooks, we were we were in a different region, so we which was coming uh, in March. We saw some of the production uh, completed goods are coming in, but coming back towards uh, end of March, we we saw within in a local context some cargo prioritization impacting certain clearance. So then again, uh, there are certain goods uh, in the port. We were we were we were taking longer than the expected for clearance. On the other side. Uh, if you look at uh, Sri Lanka, it's a uh, uh, Colombo centric when it comes to warehouse warehousing. So most of the uh, IT resellers warehouse are in Colombo, and this impacted the island wide delivery, where, which means when the Colombo was locked down and inter district traveling was also uh, a concern and a challenge. At the same time, if you look at if you go towards uh, retail sector. Social di distancing is, which was one of the important step, steps which was taken to uh, curtail the virus, but it impacted the retail sector, the small, small IT shops and uh, uh, small IT vendors who are operating. This, this impacted the cash cycle. I think cash cycles and Forex for us in our industry, when it comes to uh, imports, it's go hand in hand. Uh, if you look at, on the IT reselling, uh, IT device reselling, uh, mainly we it's about driven 100% on credit terms, where the, the large uh, resellers are working with the, the small retailers on credit terms. When when the cash cycles gets impacted, the payments also get got impacted. And, and in return, uh, even these large resellers has certain um, credit terms with the vendors. With overseas, which imports are happening in um, USD. When the current, uh, the, when the creditors days uh, increase, the uh, the tier one resellers were facing majorly uh, forex losses. These are some of the challenges that we saw within the the uh, IT device sector in Sri Lanka. So, if I move forward. Globally, uh, we have been seeing a lot of trends coming up. I think uh, even the previous speakers were talking about uh, digital transformation. I think we also see this as an opportunity, not only an opportunity, it's also becoming uh, a measure for a business continuity for most of the organization. And, and it's important uh, finding ways to take goods and services to through social media on a small uh, small and medium scale uh, uh, vendors so that was something which saw and as everybody explained online platforms be it a own platform or a shared platform we saw this happening where especially small uh, smb sector is focusing on uh, shared platforms to take their products and services and on a uh, uh, long term I think it has also shifted the focus on how well we know our customers. And this actually mainly for bigger companies, uh, they, uh, whether the data driven intelligence is happening within and whether we properly segment our customers, whether we send proper communication and the local interconnectors within the vendors and the customers, we, there's a new focus on looking at it. And then also businesses itself, uh, I would say the way we, uh, way we look at products and services, the delivery cycles. I think this was something uh, which uh, brought in a lot of focus and companies, uh, as I said, is looking at optimization initiatives. Uh, I, would, I would rather call it not a cost cut. I would say optimize, mm, uh, doing, uh, you using the existing record, uh, resources to uh, to at to the optimum level. I think with this, uh, things like bring your own device, work from home, these trends will evolve again. And then at the same time, I have mentioned each company will have to look at their capabilities of scaling up to these market trends. That's the most important thing. That's why I said I have mentioned the capabilities of each company to look at 
where we they can they, whether they have uh, the capability to scale up on their own or whether they they do a collaborative approach uh, joining with certain other uh, industry experts to drive their business forward I, I think these are some of the trends that i have been seeing and uh, before i conclude i think um, uh, madhu was uh, uh, talking about this i think i will give a broader picture what we should do at this moment of time uh, in uh, as a uh, as an approach to the market i think the first and the foremost is we have to resolve the immediate challenges we have uh, with the covid-19 that's the most important thing and maybe within the uh, micro business environment that is important and then the next thing is the resilience or the near term cash management challenges we have to uh, think of it because that will uh, decide the the business continuity in the in the short term as well as the longer run at the same time i think we are at home we uh, we have uh, we have little more time to think about our businesses i think at the same time i think we have to go back and we have to think how once the situation evolves once the knock on effects becomes clearer what are we going to do what is the next change in our business that we will have to make uh in, a, in and then as uh, uh it was previously explained the re reimagination what's the next normal is what are the shifts is going to cause us the way we do business how we we change and we plan the reinvention of of our businesses uh, to uh, to face the the tomorrow's challenges and then the next thing is we have to reform and see whether the changes that we uh, implement to the business is is in in par with the the business and the industry shifts which are happening uh, post covid 19 i think with that i will uh, pass it on to abbas thank you very much and i'll take up the questions uh, later on as as and when it comes thank you thank you ginsela that was certainly a very Uh, detailed insightful three step approach to uh, you know the current situation and uh, what we need to look at uh, i'm sure uh, quite a few pointers have been taken from our audience so so uh, move on to uh, we'll next move on to uh, the q and a session uh, essentially the q and a session uh, we've got uh, uh, loads of questions from audience so what i'll do is uh, there are some specific questions that i will uh, i will put to to our panel as well as uh, let me see if i can summarize some of those questions into maybe one or two summarize them and uh, put it to the panel so that you know we can address as many questions as possible in the limited time that we have so uh, i would like to start off my first question to, to uh, with regards to uh, uh the digital platforms i mean we know that uh, we understand that uh, you know digital platforms uh, have played a in in this lockdown and uh, i think the importance of digital platforms uh, cannot be understated now uh, so how do we encourage more investment and initiatives on uh, and what can government do to change to encourage and accelerate new projects uh, zulfa uh, if you could take that Uh, yes, so uh, I think that's a good question. I think uh, when this whole uh, this whole uh, COVID thing started, and, and obviously when a month ago when when the government announced uh, curfew, I think we were all worried about uh, whether we have the food at home to survive, right? I think that was a you know that was a, a reality check, right? Do we have the food to survive? I think uh, fortunately, you know, we have our agriculture in place. Uh, at least you know we we know that our vegetables are going to come. Right, our rice is going to come. So it was very nice to know. It was, it was actually very nice to know that. Uh, so just like that, I think technology also has a, a essential role to play, and I think we should be self-sufficient uh, uh, as a country uh, with with technology. Uh, and I think uh, that is something that the government needs to uh, identify and see what we what what the industry needs to build on that technology. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know, as a company, we've been fortunate enough. Uh, Uh, to find the money and invest on 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 technology uh, and 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 at a stage as like this you know uh, can we perform at scale right 
So that's one of the reality check for us as well, right? Uh, our ride hailing fell apart, and and soon we had to move, shift to uh, shift to uh, delivery, and were we able to uh, uh, you know uh, operate at scale, right? So I think these are these are checks and balances that the governments will have to do to make sure that if we do we have these capabilities in our country uh, to to uh, to do this. And I think as a country we are fortunate enough we have we have we have picked me as a company and we also have so many other companies uh, locally that are doing uh, these last mile uh, capabilities. Uh, I think uh, I think there's there's obviously a lot more to be done, right? I think the government needs to identify uh, uh, these companies and be able to support them, uh, uh, the, the local companies to support them to see how they can evolve. Uh, I think the I think we as a, as, as a company, we're fortunate enough to be here. Uh, and I think there's a lot more other companies out there that would need support. Uh, I, I don't want to be I don't want to go into specifics, but I think there's a lot more to be done. I think ICTA needs to recognize this and I think the government needs to recognize this. And I think uh, I think as a, as a country, we are fortunate enough that we have people here in this country uh, to to build technologies at scale, right? I think that's also very important thing, right? It's not not just building a website. It's being able to or not even building a, a mobile app. It's being able to write code or write technologies that can uh, that can perform at scale, which is one of the most important thing at this at this level. Uh, and 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 I think. As a country, we are fortunate. Obviously, our education system is really good. Uh, our universities are really good. Uh, we need to now be able to come up with companies uh, that can uh, that can evolve and and perform at, at the big stage. Bas? Yes. Thanks for that, um, Zulfa. I think um, uh, very well put. Uh, we need definitely support on on the digital platforms to see many more digital platforms such as PickMe succeed and really grow in our markets. Uh, I believe the next question that I would have is for Jayanta. Uh, of questions around uh, the fact that ICTA is uh, working, uh, starting work on Monday, and uh, some people have uh, wondered. Uh, 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 what are the safety precautions that ICT has taken uh, as well as some uh, would like to know uh, whether uh, some of the other smaller companies can uh, when can some of the uh, get back to work as well. So Jayanta over to you. OK, so we decided to go uh, start working because we have some uh, huge projects coming on uh, uh, in the near future which are going into billions. And uh, some of these projects, uh, we find it difficult uh, to be very honest uh, to work offline or, or, or actually uh, remotely. Uh, so actually, we, have, we are inviting only about 20% of the people. We'll keep the distance. We'll have a lot of other precautions. Uh, uh, we are fumigate the areas. Uh, we take other precautions so that, you know, um, there is a small risk, but of course the good news is actually uh, uh, sometimes we may open uh, the country in some areas in the very near future. Uh, because if you really look at uh, uh, the, the affected areas, uh, some of the areas are, we don't have a single COVID-19 patients or, or COVID-19 uh, uh, probable uh, risk. Uh, so open up the economy, it's uh, very important. Uh, so we were planning uh, to do this after the single and Tamil New Year. Uh, so that's why we are taking this, uh, this stance. Uh, so I think uh, one has to take uh, this, this type of direction. It's very difficult for us to tell the private sector, uh, but, we will be, but we will be doing the guidelines as I'm also in the task force. Uh, so. Uh, we will be uh, on and off announcing it to the normal public, not only the IT sector. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we have understood that ICTA has a major role to play. Uh, and I personally think uh, that uh, the, uh, the technology sector would be one of the, uh, one of the major sectors uh, that will boom, in my opinion. Uh, uh, there are many technologies would come on. Uh, because actually for a supply chain or, or for the whole uh, whole process chain to happen, uh, you know, there are other than logical uh, logical processors, there are many physical processors. 
So that's the point. That's the place where we find it difficult to manage. Uh, but some of the physical processes also uh, we have managed to uh, change it uh, through through logical processes. And uh, so a lot of lot of things are being transformed into logical process. Thereby the whole chain could be done, uh, you know, without uh, human intervention. So these things would thanks, come on. Uh, thanks, Janta. Yes. Please. OK. Yes, uh, I was just on the same lines. Janta. I was just wondering, you know, ICT had a very uh, ambitious strategy for uh, ambitious EGOV strategy. And uh, how would uh, these plans that you have be affected by uh, this pandemic as well as pro probably just uh, due to this pandemic that the government is facing? And uh, would it uh, uh, when do you practically see some of these projects, uh, you know, uh, actually take? King of the uh, you, know, you mentioned that you're already going back to work, so that's very positive. But uh, if you could share some thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, that's the very reason we are uh, coming in and uh, the, because His Excellency wants us to continue with a few of the projects, if I can say, is the ID card project, uh, the driving license project, e Grama Niladari project, the passport projects and on and on. So these are these are quite uh, quite uh, large projects. Uh, you may think that we don't have the funds to be very honest. We are OK there. And uh, the president has given the OK Great. for us to continue. Uh, so we are going ahead. Uh, the e Grama Niladari project is one of the very uh, important projects that we are handling to to uh, to sort of put in place if there's a uh, similar systems or or some uh, uh, some similar uh, crisis comes on because we are we are lucky as a country. We have about five. Uh, government officials working in the very, very remote areas uh, like the Gramaniladari, the KVSS, the PHI, where uh, many other countries don't have. So this is the exact reason that uh, we are doing quite well here. Uh, some of the people may not know. We have about 25,000 villages in this country and we are covering the whole 25,000 villages at the moment. So food distribution, even working with companies like, uh, you know, pick me, uh, you know, uh, in the future, uh, we are not stopping any of these projects. Uh, so that is a good good thing uh, for 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 the whole country. And also ICT, as you know, uh, this government has given a prominence uh, to the IT BPM industry or the technology industry. Uh, so we are going to continue with it and uh, ICTA is going to be a the center point on this and we are going to have a very uh, friendly interface between the uh, between the industry and the government. Great, I think that's that's uh, that's brilliant news. I think for the whole ICT industry that you know, I um, the green light to actually go ahead with some of these projects. I think that's that's really, really good news uh, for the whole ICT sector. Uh, thank you, Jayanta. Uh, I have uh, next a question for. for uh, can you share some predictions on how uh, and where the, the rupee would uh, perform against uh, other currencies and where we could expect how we could. Expect to devalue or value or, or or basically would it would be could be stabilized uh, some thoughts uh, on that uh, Arjuna yes <clears throat> yes Abbas uh, you can hear me right yes we can yes yeah, and can see you as well right yes so uh, uh, as we see the whole issue of exchange rate depreciation has happened already uh, we are close to 200 rupees to US dollar uh, primary reason for that is the you know the exports uh, getting hampered, uh, and of course the import restrictions are also as a result of that. Uh, further, we have a, a situation where uh, government, the debt uh, that the country has, uh, there is 4.8 billion US dollars to be paid. Uh, out of that, some of the things are already paid. There is another billion US dollars to be paid in September, and all this is causing stress. Uh, on the uh, on the exchange rate. Uh, I don't see this stress getting relieved uh, very soon uh, because the markets, exposed markets are affected seriously. Uh, our 
our remittances are affected. Um, our apparel industry is affected. I'm hoping that the apparel industry will bounce back very quickly. Uh, we are hoping for that. Of course, the markets in Europe, in the Western world has to come back to normalcy for the apparel industry to really take off. So as I see it, uh, this trend of uh, stress on the exchange rate is going to continue in the short term. Uh, I, I feel that it may even continue until, you know, September is a billion dollar repayment that is there. So I think till year end. Uh, so, so uh, you know, it's very difficult to say you know, what the exchange rate would be, but we are definitely uh, estimating it to be, you know, above 200 and what that number would be is anyone's guess. Uh, because based on how our exports performance, uh, because FDIs we cannot expect, so this solely based on uh, exports. Uh, if our apparel industry can get going, if our tea prices are strong, uh, all this will bring in, and if our petroleum, if the transport sector get affected, the expenditure we do on petroleum will get limited, and if so, then we'll have some cushioning on that. So, uh, yeah, so the exchange rate uh, will be under tremendous stress uh, of us, but of course, it might be a good news for the export uh, industry, um, uh, for technology industry, for exports that you're doing. For hopefully, you know, you'll get a better value return uh, on value on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Arjuna, for that, uh, uh, for that insight into what we could expect. Or, or the I also have a question for uh, Professor Larith here. Uh, essentially, we've been talking about uh, a lot about, you know, the whole aspects of uh, e-learning, remote learning actually becoming very popular. But uh, we all know that there are certain uh, limitations and certain restrictions in online learning as well. Uh, what are the in online learning versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, conventional uh, the conventional learning system and how do you propose educators could overcome this? Abbas, I didn't hear one part of your question. If you don't mind repeating the last bit. Sure, I said I was uh, I was stating that uh, uh, how would you propose that you know uh, uh, overcome issues with regards to uh, online learning uh, as opposed to conventional learning and what are the issues and how would you propose they would uh, educators could over over oh, um, the, yeah. see the education um, uh, cannot be 100 percent online we also need to um, conduct uh, laboratory classes particularly for um, certain fields like engineering and so on so one of the things that we need to do is uh, you know uh, to introduce uh, you know, hybrid models. So you deliver certain things online, but some of the other things will have to be, you know, um, physical. There are uh, group activities that need to be done together. Uh, so there is interaction that is needed. So I think some of the limitations of this particular method of uh, delivery is uh, access to devices, right? Um, access to data and the coverage that we have in Sri Lanka because certain areas are not covered well. Um, as I said, the interactiveness, um, the inability to conduct uh, proper lab classes, and also ultimately, I think if you are producing a good graduate, graduates have a lot of attributes. Knowledge is only one aspect of it. There are other graduate attributes. How do they apply knowledge? How do they engage in a project? How do they you know, research and develop new solutions? How do they interact with uh, uh, other team members? How do they socially integrate? All these will have to be uh, you know, addressed um, in, a, in a comprehensive education network where you can't 100% do uh, online, uh, but uh, physical interaction is also necessary. Abbas? Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lalit. Uh, I think that was an interesting uh, thought process on uh, online education and its restrictions. Uh, my next question would be uh, to uh, Madhu. Uh, essentially, Madhu, how do you foresee uh, the forecasted figures uh, on ICT exports that uh, you know uh, the industry has been talking about? How do you foresee the effects of uh, this pandemic? figures 
and uh, just i would also like to add another question there as to uh, how do you see the competitive matrices uh, uh, changing in the global it bpo outsourcing space is there still going to be emphasis on innovation quality or is it going to be a price game uh, what uh, what are your thoughts on that yeah Abbas, just uh, for actual numbers, it's probably early days for us to, you know, get a sense whether what would it be the impact. Um, what if you look at uh, what what we see is that definitely on the short run there will be challenges, right? Where the next six to twelve months, uh, I'm sure most companies will go through challenges as our customers and and clients go through their business challenges, right? As you know. A lot of the technology companies are providing services for and products to other companies. But if you really look at uh, beyond that, as people come out of this, as every company is trying to go digital and trying to take advantage of digital, as uh, as the companies are trying to reduce costs by automating and, and driving that, we will see, uh, we will have a, a uptake almost going back beyond the what we had in the past, right? You know, this we've seen in the each of the, you know, whether it's a uh, global financial crisis, whether it's a dot com uh, bust, we, we've seen that, right? There is always a, uh, you know, two, three quarters, sometimes four quarter pause, and every company is trying to figure out what to do. And then digital come into play as a main way to expand market as well as to reduce cost, right? Which are two things that most companies will want to do and most boards are worried about. How do we really increase our market share? How do you drive revenue? And at the same time, how do you drive uh, reduce cost, right? So in both technology plays a big role. So so in that sense, I think our industry uh, is resilient and, and then we will come off the initial uh, 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 wait and see that the companies will go through, our clients will go through and it will bounce back stronger is is if you look at the past is prologue this is what we think will happen and how long it will go is you know i think anybody's guess right right now but certainly it will bounce back with a uh, with more digital adoption more optimization that our clients and companies are trying to do Lovely. Uh, so uh, I believe to summarize, uh, you believe that this is more of a short term thing and the long term impacts could, could actually. Great. Uh, my next question would be to uh, Naina. Uh, Naina, what are your thoughts on the support that government could extend in the Sri Lankan ICT industry, considering the financial challenges, uh, also keeping in mind the financial challenges that the government is uh, uh, is going to face with uh, with uh, uh, standstill and uh, uh, you know and the costs that uh, the government is currently absorbing as well. Uh, any thoughts on on the, what support the ICT industry yeah. um, uh, could uh, get from government? Uh, my take on that one is uh, actually now everyone is. Uh, most of us are thinking that government uh, can bail us out of this situation, but I don't agree with that one. But certainly government can help the industry or the the, the, the country in the sense in our uh, economy uh, by way of uh, giving us little support here and there. The one of the, uh, not here and there, of course, you know, some, some great support. Um, one of the ma main supports that I would like the government to uh, give us is um, bringing new uh, amendments to this labor laws. That is one uh, big uh, obstacle that most of us are, as entrepreneurs and this, uh, the companies have today uh, in even restructuring, resizing our organizations. Now, I can, I, uh, can see a lot of uh, information is being exchanged in the in the market today saying that many companies are uh, you know reducing uh, their salaries in terms of uh, main uh, bringing their operational expenditure down um, reducing uh, allowances and all these things of course even i had uh, a, a similar uh, session yesterday with a senior commissioner from the labor department uh, and uh, unfortunately uh, most of these uh, strategies that we think that we can do are not legal. 
so even though we do it with the uh, as for the current situation but uh, uh, if someone challenges that one maybe a union or a individual employee go and challenges um, in the uh, against the labor law of this country uh, you know uh, this this uh, this is not a possibility so therefore my understanding is that all almost all the labor laws uh, acts that we have actually imposed uh, implemented in sri lanka are one side only looking at the employee's side not the employer's side uh, it has forgotten the fact that for employees to survive uh, it is a must that employers survive first so that's the way but unfortunately maybe for some reason uh, probably obvious reasons in fact <laughs> as we all know um, all these uh, acts that has been passed in uh, in sri lanka uh, and being uh, practiced are uh, one sided only uh, uh, only uh, looking at the employee's side and then uh, employers have not given any opportunity any uh, room there uh, to basically um, resize um, their organization strategize their organizations bring their cost down the way they want you know um, with, even with good intention of um, Uh, maintaining the employees without being uh, uh, terminate them so my 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 take is that it's unfortunate the thing is that the only way that the entrepreneurs have is in that sense uh, to close down the company but anyway that is the negative side of it but positive side of it uh, if that government can actually bring some sort of an amendment to this uh, current labor laws and give some um, the freedom for organizations to um make the make the necessary adjustments for the betterment of the company better betterment of the uh, of the sustainability of the company that be a great thing the other thing that i actually see is that as we all discussed there are so much of opportunities that are being uh, created because of this situation so therefore we have to be very positive not not on, always negative on this current situation there are so many positive things are happening so we we must understand that one i am particularly happy that uh, both uh, jayanth and uh, professor lalit mentioned that government the ict and government has taken a decision uh, to uh, uh, give priority for sri lankan products uh, when they do procurement in the government sector this is fantastic because as i know uh, the largest ict uh, buyer is the government and the banking sector and today both of them are actually uh, both of these industry the segments are um, uh, under under pressure but still if they can actually give that um concern uh, to local local developed products because you not know, we have uh, equally good or better products compared to any other foreign products uh, in sri lanka so therefore uh, that will be a huge support uh, to the ict industry and then uh, i i even suggest that uh, if they can actually consider uh, if uh, the the jayanth is hearing this one of course he can take the message to the government and then see if they can actually uh increase the uh, domestic preference allowance which is 20% as of now is uh, increased to maybe 40% so that you know uh, we get uh, the industry get uh, better um, better um opportunities to serve uh, the local in the local uh, market so that is uh, another way then the other thing is government have to be a catalyst in uh, creating some trends in the, in sri lanka this is what i always always Uh, want to see it is happening in the sense as an example we can actually uh, change the way we do uh, things now we, we were talking about going online uh, the digital platforms uh, and uh, especially a trend of working uh, work from home now there are very good things in the sense you know that those things can basically uh, uh, create a lot of opportunities um, in the market um, but even going behind beyond that uh, as an example now our uh, garment sector hospitality sector um, then uh, the hotels and in all these uh, sectors are badly badly um, affected because of this uh, depression uh, in the, uh, the the overseas markets so, so therefore probably uh, maybe government can actually create some trends in sri lanka uh, so that you know those local products are being consumed uh, and those affected industries can actually look at supporting or uh producing towards the, the the local markets in the sense so w- one such uh, uh, one such um, suggestion that actually i i try to 
um, popular uh, in our, uh, you know, among our societies that uh, if the government can, this is only an example uh, I'm talking about because I, I learned this one from Indonesia. Um, if the government can uh, uh, consider uh, mandating all government officers to wear Sri Lankan, uh, Sri Lankan made batik or maybe uh, our, our hands loom, uh, hands loom um, on, on Fridays. Uh, and, you know, even the, 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 the private sector can actually follow that. And so that you, know, you can actually create a trend of uh, local, uh, the, the hand looms and batiks are being, uh, being uh, consumed or, or used in Sri Lanka. And then, you know, that will basically create a new trend, a new industry, and that will uh, uh, generate more employment. And even these uh, affected uh, garment uh, industry uh, organizations can even look uh, inside and then see how they can actually facilitate uh, stitching uh, uh, for the Sri Lankan um, market in the sense, you know, something like that. And even uh, if the government can even consider that uh, batik or the handloom as an official dress for any occasion, you know, they give the due, due recognition for this one. So, this is a trend that I'm talking about. So like that, there are so many trends that we can actually create and then the government can be the catalyst in, in promoting uh, that kind of uh, uh, the, this one. So this is the main support that I expect from the government is not basically giving money and bailing them, uh, bailing uh, to try to bail out uh, organizations because we have to stand on our own feet. We cannot sustain, we cannot depend on the government support, government uh, funding all the time. It may be one month, two months, but you know this this issue is going to be very much beyond that. Maybe year. So we, we then how are you? How are we going to basically uh, survive? So if you look at uh, uh, only the government. So therefore, I mean, don't don't think that government can feed us uh, all the, all this uh, time, and don't expect uh, government to you know uh, bail us out uh, from these difficulties. We have to find our own ways to do that one. So for that creation of new markets, new opportunities and going behind it and then strategizing, come out with new innovations, right? And then those are the things that we have to be basically considered. So uh, this is a few things that I actually suggested, but of course uh, there are many more, but uh, due to the time constraints that I have, uh, I would like to stop at that time. Then back to Abbas. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Nana. Uh, my next question would be to, uh, to Riza. Uh, Riza, what are the best you uh, propose for companies going back to work uh, post uh, post curfew uh, you know as a, as a global as part of a, as a representative of a global organization could you share some of your in insight this is uh, abbas i missed your first part of your question you said uh, uh, best okay yes so my question was what are the best practices you, you companies going back to uh, work post the curfew so what are your, uh, what would be some of the best practices that, uh, you know, your organization is seeing? So uh, what we are seeing, what we are seeing now, now is that, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, from internally, what uh, organization, as an organization we are looking at is that, how do we start the operations when the lockdown is removed, right? Uh, and it's going to be gradual. It's not going to be all at once uh, is what we all know, right? So a few things that's happening is we are drawing up guidelines in in terms of how uh, employees and how organization needs to work during this interim period, right? Uh, like I think um, even um, uh, Naina and Arjuna and even Jantha said, it's not all who will be able to come to work. So we'll have to have some kind of arrangement as to who is going to come to work, when they're going to come to work, and how do we have that schedule kind of planned out, right? Uh, number two is that uh, we need to ensure that uh, when people come into work, they also abide by these guidelines. So there is a uh, 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 there is a possibility that we may have to have some kind of a self declaration, right? So that uh, you know, everybody is consciously accepting coming into work and they are agreeing to certain guidelines that have been set, laid down so that nobody breaks those guidelines because uh, one person breaking that guideline can be an impact to everyone, right? Uh, number three 
is uh, how do we then interact with clients? Right? Because that would be the next step, right? So then we have to come to some kind of protocol in terms of how do we now start having meetings or how do we start interacting with clients, right? It can be at client premises, it can be at our own office premises. Or do we continue with the uh, the remote uh, video conferencing facilities? Are some of the questions that are being asked now? And we are drawing up guidelines uh, to kind of start that uh, part of the work at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. And uh, I think uh, what we have next is basically I have a question for Ginsara, and that is uh, uh, what is the current position device availability in Sri Lanka? Can we manage during uh, this period of reports control or is, do you see a substantial shortage? Uh, I would just like a question from the audience as to uh, whether you know IT ICT products could be considered uh, uh, to be not in the imports restricted item. Maybe uh, you could just answer this to give us more clarity. Yeah. Uh, so uh, okay. If you look at, uh, let me reflect on some of the pointers which I gave you I gave during my sure. initial brief. Sure. So if you uh, if you look at uh, more hundred percent most of our manufacturing for devices this is uh, in uh, in terms of uh, desktops and notebooks happens in china uh, and then i was also i was mentioning uh, if i uh, in uh, fi19 we we approximately we have been shifting on average about 70000 devices on a quarter and uh, looking at the, the production constraints that uh, we had, uh, I think uh, in month of February, we, were, we, we couldn't ship out the anticipated uh, shipments or imports to the country. So taking this into uh, consideration and also uh, looking at uh, some of the initiatives that we were going to take in terms of working from home, uh, maybe probably learning from home, things like that. And uh, that is mainly targeting remote product productivity and distance learning. We, I, I foresee if the uh, import controls continue, we will see certain shortages on the devices. Because as, as uh, in ad addition to that, I would also just want to say, uh, especially we, we see a drastic shift from desktops to notebooks. And in order to accommodate this, I think we will not have sufficient devices in the market. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Ginsera. I think uh, uh, the question following that would probably be uh, uh, to Jayanta. Jayanta would like to know if this lock down while uh, would you see the would you think that uh, uh, you know uh, ICT products could be mandated as essential products or uh, do you still feel that uh, it needs to have some level of control in the amount of uh, ICT products coming into the country uh, yes at the moment uh, of course the, what we are planning is to ensure that uh, uh, for maintenance uh, for for uh, you you have adequate stocks uh, and then we would uh, prove it. Uh, but for sales at the moment we are not taking a decision, uh, so we are discussing it most probably uh, in a day or two on that uh, how we should be. Uh, but of course, uh, as you know, this government is always giving priority to us. And uh, but what we are trying to do is actually for banks and all the other essential service and for customers. Uh, in order to maintain the equipments and the necessary infrastructure plus the systems uh, for us to uh, give the OK. Uh, so but uh, as for sales, you know, we have a genuine problem at the moment, so that would be taken up uh, at the very highest level. Uh, but uh, I would say we would support it, uh, but at the moment I, I cannot say uh, much about it. Uh, but uh, but what I want to say is just in conclusion, uh, we have taken a firm decision that Sri Lanka, our priority would be for Sri Lankan companies and we would compromise some of the uh, 
uh, attributes uh, and give Sri Lankan companies. So in our major pro uh, projects, uh, we have taken a decision uh, that uh, uh, the highest priority would be for the Sri Lankan industry. So that I can vouch for you. And uh, as, as ICTA, we would definitely support that. And the total board members and all of us are in the same thought and in the same direction. Sure. Thank you, Jayan. And I have a question for you with regards to, you know, we have seen, uh, like uh, Madhu mentioned earlier, when, you know, when the necessity arises, that kind of uh, creates uh, people to uh, change faster. So, uh, can you share some of the uh, great uh, digital adoption stories that uh, you have personally seen within government or within public sector? Uh, you mean uh, the recent ones? Yes, the recent ones. Okay, now we have, uh, we are one of the very few countries or I mean one or two countries that we have when we open the airport, uh, there are about at the moment over uh, almost about 60 to 70,000 people clamoring to come back to Sri Lanka. Uh, obviously, we can't bring them all. Uh, so we are doing a system where uh, you know that they would uh, have to have a uh, almost something like a permit uh, to come to Sri Lanka. So we will have a criteria to bring down them. Uh, so anyway, the, the airport would have a major, uh, major pr problem in handling all of them. And uh, we would actually, we have already put in place, uh, it's already in place and already uh, could be in operation even from today that a person when he buys from uh, the ticket uh, from that moment up to his home uh, and from there uh, he he will be his uh, data will be captured and if you want we can monitor so it's a huge uh, program we are working with the immigration and we are working with the health department and the minister of health uh, so uh, we have already put that in place the second one is actually once even today uh, we can actually uh, you know, uh, for most of these uh, victims and su suspected victims, we can monitor. Uh, so this has been done with the help of uh, the uh, me, uh, health, with the help of uh, the uh, uh, the defense. Uh, this is moving on well, and that is how you would see that most of these people have been traced. Uh, so we have already done that, and then uh, uh, we have uh, someone was talking about garment. Uh, you know, uh, I, I would say to be very honest, government today uh, is has become, uh, don't get me wrong, has become more efficient than the private sector at the moment <laughs> because 79 of the government institutions are using our own, uh, our own uh, 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 remote uh, system or our own uh, system developed by, developed by us and they are all uh, working uh, from home and um, and we are giving it free and here i should mention and thank all the telecom operators who have uh, given uh, everything to us free so even without any data uh, they could uh, they could discuss and uh, they could uh, communicate uh, so this is one thing and then the doctors uh, as you know we have taken two of the uh, programs uh, developed by Sri Lanka uh, to meet doctor, uh, doctor, and then from that doctor uh, you can you can consult the doctors, and then you can get the prescription, and then you can get the medicine to your home. As uh, as uh, uh, you know, we have already uh, tied up uh, the garment. In, in that case, has tied up with Pick Me uh, to deliver goods uh, with Satosa. Uh, so these are some of the things and we have done much, much more. Uh, we are trying to do with the education. Uh, we are trying to do with the health. We are trying to do insurance would be something that we didn't discuss. Uh, insurance is going to be a huge difference in the future. Uh, we never even our companies when we plan contingency plans, everything, uh, you know, this type of contingencies were never planned. And uh, so uh, there will be a lot of uh, insurance companies coming out with solutions. And just to add up and conclude my, uh, my uh, uh, presentation, I would try to say that some of the companies are changing their salespeople to account managers. So uh, because you have to keep your uh, accounts 
and your customers very happy. So this is something very, very important. Uh, and I also say, uh, believe in your instincts, uh, not to go by a lot of research, lot of, not to read a lot of uh, things, but your instincts. Because I personally, in my life, I've gone through instincts and I have been successful. And I call upon everyone because we have the strength. Uh, because as a lot of people say, tough period will not continue, but the tough people would continue. So I would, uh, I would always say that have faith in ourselves, have faith in the country, and I think we could succeed in this and come out of this. Oh, it's you, Abbas. Thank you, Jayana. Very true. It's uh, as the as the saying goes, uh, the going get uh, the tough get going when the going gets tough. So uh, that's very true. Uh, I believe uh, we have more question which we can take we are getting an overwhelming uh, list of questions i'm trying to uh, see uh, what i could pick up but essentially one of the questions would be properly from the on the education task for me directed to uh, professor lalit gamge uh, professor any thoughts on the can you give us uh, share some uh, share something on what's happening with regards to uh, students uh, at home and what is the uh, what's happening what are the plans put into place at the education task force Yes, uh, I thank you for that question. Uh, you see, I'm in office today. Uh, why? Because uh, we have a large number of teachers uh, recording lessons uh, here. You know, um, um, with the, uh, this is an initiative of the Education Ministry under the Honorable Minister of um, Education, uh, Honorable Dallas Peruma, and we join hands with them uh, with NIE to put Although we've been trying to do this for a long period of time, you know, because of this pressure, it has become possible to put all lessons. So we, we were looking at um, various um, media to do this. Obviously, we have to also ensure, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, penetration to all walks of life. So it has to be an equitable solution. So we came up with uh, programs for television. So uh, from next Monday onwards, uh, we will be telecasting. Uh, we have recorded uh, many lessons over the last uh, uh, week and a half or so. So we will be going live on um, uh, Channel I and also Netra, uh, uh, starting with uh, A-levels, uh, A O-levels and grade five programs. So, it will be completely, the channel I is completely devoted to um, education um, until this, uh, you know, pandemic is over, until children, uh, you know, come back to school. And, you know, what we have, this is, this was a great opportunity. What we have developed now is a very uh, rich uh, database of lessons, which could be used in time to come because, you know, education ministry is buying large number of uh, computers and these computers will be um, distributed to, you know, even the remotest uh, school. So the, the the real opportunity is when, you know, it's very difficult to get maths teachers, English teachers to uh, into remote schools. And these lessons will now be available. And some of these lessons were delivered by, you know, very eminent professors from universities, top-notch uh, teachers. And the... The, the students from remote schools uh, will have access to this material even after uh, this telecast is over. I think this is a very good initiative and uh, we will see a lot of equity in education um, coming out of this crisis as a result of this crisis. So fantastic. Yeah, sure. Fantastic. Uh, uh, then, professor, I think uh, all of us uh, will very much appreciate it. Uh, if I may also add, it will not just be uh, educational material. We will also have other skills developed, you know, the how to discipline, uh, how to develop discipline, how to develop communication skills, how to develop leadership. So these are, you know, 21st century skills will also be, you know, delivered through uh, this method. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Professor. Um, lovely. I think we, we've got an overwhelming list of questions uh, uh, on my list. Uh, unfortunately, due to the con time constraints, uh, we would have to kind of uh, conclude now. And uh, I hope that all of you have really benefited.
benefited from this uh, forum, from this program, and uh, uh, we will try our best to answer most of the questions that have been uh, filled up and uh, try and get back to you with some of the with as many questions as we could possibly answer. So the fitness secretariat will will take that initiative and try to uh, get back to you with uh, as many answers as we can provide uh, the time constraints where we cannot take them during this forum. So uh, let me now uh, come to uh, the conclusion part of this forum and uh, what I'd like to start off by uh, basically thanking our uh, esteemed panelists and our keynote speaker once again. Uh, thank you very much uh, to, to uh, Mr. Arjuna Herat, uh, Professor Lalit Gamage, uh, Mr. Madhur Ratnayaka, Dr. Nayana Dehigama, uh, Mr. Riza Wadud, Mr. Jeffrey Zulfa, and Mr. Ginser Dias. Thank you for valuable time. I'm sure everyone uh, who has joined this forum has very much appreciated it. I would also like to take this opportunity to once again thank our sponsors, our event partners, Partner Technologies, uh, our knowledge partner Understand Young, our corporate partners Lanka Bell, LKL Domain Registry, Luna Labs, Aurel IT, Sarva Colombo, Zillion, and, and our messaging partner. Uh, it goes without saying that all the all the chambers that have supported us uh, has have done a great job. The National Chamber of Commerce of Sri Lanka, Colombo Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of Commerce of Sri Lanka. Um, I would like to uh, kind of uh, end. Uh, today's session with a very thought provoking sentiment taking from what Madhu uh, during his initial uh, discussion. You know, uh, with all the destruction and havoc that COVID 19 is causing, we are also seeing some very interesting positives coming up, right? So, for example, Madhu highlighted the environmental impact because of the lockdown is very, very positive. With greenhouse emissions reducing. So basically, Mother Nature is getting an opportunity to heal itself. Uh, we've also having, uh, we are also having uh, a huge, I mean, before the lockdown or before people were locked down, we had this whole aspects of accidents, road accidents. So we had globally, we had 3,500 dying per day due to road accidents. So that's over 100,000 people a month dying uh, due to road accidents. That has come down. We're seeing government focusing on most government focusing on giving more importance to healthcare, to education, to research over large scale infrastructure firms. We are seeing uh, and uh, seeing a very difference in mindset. We're seeing that you know uh, the whole concept of uh, 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 concept of family bonds are getting stronger. We're seeing a local produce being a focus of communities we are seeing materialism reducing and social expectations also reset so just like to leave you with a very interesting thought maybe, maybe is this nature's way of telling us is our ambition to succeed kind of uh, have we lost perspective of what is really important to us so i thought at the end of this session so you may agree disagree or agree to disagree anyway I wish you all a very good evening and thank you for you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.